Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract 1. Listening part A, you hear a consultant talking to a patient, Miss Wells, who has been referred by her GP due to a history of endometriosis. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look through the notes. Oh, hello, Miss Wells. Please come in and sit down. I'm Miss Moore, the consultant. I've read your GP's referral letter, which details your history of endometriosis. I wonder if I could start off by asking you a few questions. How old are you? Uh, I'm 22. Are you married? No, but I live with my partner. Have you ever been pregnant? No. And when was your last cervical smear? Um, uh, that would have been done when I went to see my GP, mm -hmm. probably three months ago now. It was all normal. Okay, great. Now, I gather you've had some pelvic pain recently. Yes, that's right. Uh, it started in February mm -hmm. of this year, a sharp pain in the left side of my stomach. It usually came on a few days before my period and then seemed to settle down at the end of my period. Okay. After February, the pain got really bad, and it wouldn't go away. I was admitted to hospital. Oh dear. Yeah, the consultant there performed a laparoscopy, and it revealed that on my left ovary and behind my womb, I had endometriosis. After that, he suggested I should take the pill without a break. But the pain didn't get any better, so he started me on progesterone tablets, mm -hmm. which made me feel horrible. Mm. I put on weight and felt bloated all the time. I also developed acne. I hadn't had that since I was a teenager, but the pain still didn't get any better. So the consultant readmitted me in May of this year and performed another laparoscopy and treated the endometriosis with a diathemy. After that, I was much better and the pain almost completely went away. That was until August when it returned. Uh, it's been slowly getting worse since then, and again, as in the beginning, it's in my stomach and it hurts just before my periods. Only now the pain is there at all different times, and it really hurts when I'm having intercourse, especially in certain positions. Right, I see. And are your periods regular? Yes, regular because I'm taking the pill again with a week's break. The last one was about three weeks ago. What about any other health concerns? No, everything else is fine. I've never been a smoker, but I do like a drink at weekends. Just one or two though, nothing crazy. Mm -hmm. My family are all well too. No serious illness in either my mum or dad, or in my older sister. Nothing else I can think of really. And do you have any problems passing urine or with your bowel motions? No, that's all good too. All right, Miss Wells, I think it would be sensible to have a look at you and run some tests. Then we can chat about how to take things forward. But from what you've told me, my initial suspicions are that the endometriosis might have come back. That's what I was afraid of. Since I was first diagnosed, I've been doing a lot of reading, so I was really worried when the pain returned. I'd like to be able to have children in the future, and I'm worried it might be difficult with the endometriosis. I really don't want to be one of those women who ends up having problems getting pregnant. I'm also really sick and tired of the pain. It's beginning to feel like I'll be stuck with it forever. I can tell it's starting to affect my mood. Just ask my boyfriend.
Extract 2 questions 13 to 24. Four questions 13 to 24 complete the notes with word or a short phrase. Oh, hello, nurse. My husband seems quite settled now, so I can answer those questions, if you like. Yes, Mrs Georges, now's a good time. Come in and have a seat. So how are you feeling now that Mr Georges is here with us? Oh, I know it was the right decision. Being the only carer for my husband has been such hard work, and we did discuss everything fully with the social workers and our doctor. But I do miss having him with me at home. It had to happen though, and I'm completely worn out. Do you mind telling me more about your husband? I do wish you could have seen him before all this happened. He was so active and alert, always helping people. He was in the Navy when he was younger, so he'd often spend months away at a time. I got quite used to being on my own before he retired. I hope you've got family nearby to help out and keep you company. Oh, I won't be lonely. Our son lives just round the corner and we have a daughter who comes to visit as often as she can. She has a young family now though, so she's quite busy. I really lost my husband when his mind started to go. When did you first notice something was wrong? Hard to say exactly. I suppose you expect your memory to get worse, so you put the little lapses down as getting older. We all lose our glasses and forget our names. But then it became clear it was more than that. He started to seem muddled, you know, confused by everyday things like making a pot of tea. He would put the tea bags into the kettle instead of in the pot, or the cups, or he'd forget about the kettle altogether and try making tea with cold water. How was he in himself? At first he knew something was wrong. He was frustrated and would fly off the handle with me and I'd snap back at him. I suppose I didn't realise he couldn't help it. I feel teary now just talking about it. After 40 years of marriage, we knew what the other was thinking most of the time. But now we can't understand one another at all. I'm sorry, Mrs Georges. In the beginning, when I really started to suspect something wasn't right, one of the main things he'd do would be ask me the same question again and again. I'd say to him, Bob, you're driving me mad. And he'd just smile and the next minute he'd do it again. But now he hardly speaks at all. How is he with his everyday tasks? Oh, he has a lot of trouble with dressing. I have to help him. It's as if he's completely forgotten what it is he has to do. Getting him to have a shave is another issue. He won't do it and he pushes me away if I try to help. I hate to see him looking so untidy. He was always so particular about the way he looked. Maybe you'll have better luck with him than I had. Perhaps. Oh, in the last few months he started to wander off during the day. That's been a real problem. He would go out the front door and down the street before I even knew what was happening. I was sure that one day he was going to get hit by a car and then he stopped knowing the difference between day and night and would get up out of bed at all hours. That really frightened me. I used to wonder what would happen if he turned on the gas for the oven. He was always playing with the controls for it during the day. I'd lay there in bed in the dark listening to hear if he was going to get up and then when I finally did fall asleep any little noise would wake me. That's what finally convinced me to bring him here. In this part of the test, 
you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you will hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. You hear two doctors discussing a patient. Oh, Dr. Khan, have you got a moment? I wanted to talk to you about polypeptide. Sure, Dr. Jones. Polly is a six-year-old girl with a medical history of asthma and eczema who was admitted yesterday for an asthma exacerbation. She presented with shortness of breath and cough after visiting her grandparents, who are smokers. She responded well to albuterol and prednisolone in the emergency department, but was admitted due to persistent hypoxia in room air. She was also given a recent dose of acetaminophen because of fever. Her current temperature is 39.7 degrees Celsius. How is she on auscultation? There are significant audible expiratory wheezes throughout the left lung and in the right upper regions. Her breathing sounds are diminished and there is an absence of wheezes towards the right base. Possible bacterial pneumonia? Dr Jones, that's what I was thinking. I'm sending her for a full range of tests to confirm. Thank you, Dr Khan. You hear a dietitian talking to a patient. There are reasons the doctor talked to you about being on a diet that's low in fat. I know, but I like salami, cheese and chips. A meal's not a meal without bread and butter. Mm, I can understand that it's hard for you. I myself have tried to eliminate nearly all the fat from my own diet, and it is difficult to give up the things we love so much. What foods have you had to give up? Well, ice cream was my favourite. I used to have a bowl of it almost every night. But there's been others, butter, sausages. Look, no one's saying that you can't eat fatty foods occasionally you really do need to try and reduce your overall fat intake if you want to start feeling better. Here, let's look at a possible meal plan. It'll give you a better idea of what I'm talking about. You hear a professor of emergency medicine giving a presentation to a group of trainee doctors. European wasps feed on meat and meat products, such as dog food and barbecue scraps. They also like to scavenge sweet food and drinks and steal honey from beehives. Their stings are not barbed like bee stings. This means a single wasp can sting repeatedly. The toxins in the sting will cause a powerful reaction, and in some people, an allergic reaction. Because they are attracted to food, Many wasp stings are in or around the mouth. These are the most dangerous places for a sting, as swelling can result. Minor reactions include painful swellings on the lips, while in severe cases, there can be a blockage of the trachea due to swelling, and in the most severe cases, this can even lead to death. You hear a GP talking to a regular patient who has been having kidney problems. Hello, Mr. Hartley. Come and sit down. I gather you've been having more trouble since I last saw you. Yes, that's right. I've kept vomiting and feeling dreadful. 
I can't keep on like this. Mm. It looks as though the next step will be to get you to hospital to start further treatment. I think you're going to need peritoneal dialysis treatment. What's that, Doctor? It means putting a tube into the abdomen and then washing fluid in and out to keep the toxic substances in the blood down. It's not uncomfortable and you'll be taught to do this yourself for when you get home. With this method of dialysis, you can walk about and live a reasonably normal life. Well, will I have to use this for the rest of my life? Well, we will also take a specimen of your blood and put you in the computer database for a kidney transplant. If a suitable kidney becomes available, you may be able to undergo a kidney transplant operation. So you see, there are several ways of helping you. We'll just have to see how you get on. You hear a physiotherapist in a hospital talking with John, a new patient. Okay, John, now that we've established you're not going to be playing sport, here's what you're going to need to do for the next two to four weeks. Okay. First of all, you're going to have to wear a neck brace. You can get one in the shop down the ground floor. Do I wear that at night, like when I'm sleeping? Well, you can, but you don't have to. Okay. One thing that will help you with the pain is a nice pack for 10 to 20 minutes, followed by a nice warm shower. Okay. Um, I'll still probably be working a bit. We don't have a shower there. If you're at work, you can just use a warm cloth instead. Another really good thing to do is neck and back stretches. We can go through them now if you like. Okay, great. You hear a specialist physician and a nurse discussing a patient's treatment. Ah, nurse, hello. Um, I'm wondering if you can help me. I've just been going over the charts for Mr. Chu in bed 34 and I'm wondering why I wasn't told that his blood pressure medications were being held over the past few days. Oh, hi, Dr. Greisman. Right. I'm not sure. I didn't even know that had happened. Let me look into it and get back to you. There's no need for that. I've been sitting here for 20 minutes looking at the blood pressures and medications that have been given to the patient, and it simply doesn't make any sense. Well, I really don't know, Doctor. I've literally taken care of this patient for four hours. I can discuss it with the nursing director, though, if you like. No, that isn't necessary. Thank you, nurse. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best, according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract 1. You hear a nurse called Sally Perkins giving a presentation on tetanus to a group of hospital trainees. Good morning. My name is Sally Perkins and I'm one of the registered nurses working here at the hospital. Very soon I'm going to highlight the importance of immunisation and medical treatment for tetanus infection by talking about some case reports but first I'd like to give you a little background on the disease. Tetanus is caused by a toxin produced in bacteria found worldwide in soil, dust and manure. And it can contaminate many surfaces and substances. Because of this, the disease cannot be eradicated completely. But infection can be prevented through immunisation with tetanus toxoid containing vaccines. People who contract tetanus and recover do not have natural immunity, so they can be reinfected and therefore 
also need to be immunised. To be protected throughout life, the World Health Organisation recommends that an individual receives six doses of a tetanus toxoid containing vaccine, which can be done through a routine immunisation program. Tetanus is characterised by painful muscular contractions and spasms. Involvement of the muscles of the jaw and neck has led to tetanus also being known as lockjaw. It's not directly transmitted from person to person. Instead, the bacteria enters the body through a cut or wound. The majority of patients develop the disease as a result of a deep wound or puncture. But even a tiny pinprick or scratch can be enough for the bacteria to enter the body. Although tetanus cases are much rarer than they used to be, tetanus is still a life-threatening disease because of inadequate vaccination levels and inappropriate wound care. Another major issue is that only one-third of people who have a tetanus-prone wound actually seek medical treatment. One of the main reasons given by people for not getting tetanus vaccine is that we already have high levels of naturally occurring antitoxin through unintentionally ingesting the tetanus bacteria in day-to-day -day living granting natural immunity without ever needing a single dose of medication or vaccination. Others state that if you've potentially been exposed to tetanus, fully cleaning the wound will reduce the potential for bacteria to enter the bloodstream. The problem with these approaches is that if you've been infected and aren't aware of it, medical treatment may come too late. Now I'd like to present some case studies to illustrate the danger of taking tetanus protection for granted. First, the case of a 45-year-old woman who lives on a farm and sought medical care after experiencing leg, back and jaw pain, although she had no specific injury. Because the woman was also having difficulty breathing, doctors had to do a tracheotomy and put her on a ventilator. After two weeks in intensive care, the patient faced weeks of physical rehabilitation. In all, the woman was hospitalised for six weeks of medical care. Because the symptoms were recognised early on and because the woman hadn't completely stopped breathing, she was able to make a complete recovery. She had not received a regular tetanus booster shot and the status of her primary vaccination was unknown. The second incident I'd like to share with you occurred when a four-year-old boy was taken by his parents to the GP with a one-week history of general malaise, mild fever, lethargy and weight loss. He subsequently developed dysphagia, difficulties opening his mouth and dehydration. Due to the concerns about the boy's refusal of fluids, the paediatrician was consulted. The boy then began to show signs of locked jaw and muscle rigidity. Together with the lack of immunisation and a toenail infection, this finally led to the diagnosis of tetanus. The boy was then transferred to a paediatric intensive care unit for initial treatment Initially, the frequency and severity of his muscle spasms increased during the day in ICU, but he did make a full recovery after four further weeks of treatment. The final case involves an otherwise healthy 53-year-old man who arrived at the emergency department of his local hospital complaining of severe stiffness in his jaw and difficulty swallowing, but without any apparent wounds or cuts. Following an exhaustive examination and attempts to alleviate his symptoms, a diagnosis of tetanus was made by the medical team. He was treated with tetanus immunoglobulin and tetanus toxoid and kept unconscious for two weeks. The man was discharged after spending nearly a month in hospital, including his nearly three-week stay in the ICU, and he was not able to recall the date of his last tetanus vaccination. I'm sure you'll agree this case highlights how everyone is at risk of the disease. Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You hear an interview with Dr. Delia Mean, who was Team USA's Chief Medical Officer at the Sochi Winter Olympic Games. For questions 37 to 42, complete the notes with a word or short phrase.
So, Dr. Mean, what did being CMO mean? Well, it meant overseeing 77 other healthcare professionals and taking care of 228 U.S. Olympians. As a CMO, I worked in tandem with a team to deliver the highest level of care to our athletes. We were using the latest technology, evaluating a mix of treatments to ensure peak performance, and were ready to respond to whatever might have come our way. It also meant working long and busy hours during the games where the team faced everything from common colds and illness to traumatic injury. And it also meant having compassion and understanding while applying your medical expertise in a fast moving environment. Can you give me a behind the scenes description of what the medical support of the athletes looked like? Yes, absolutely. Well, it looked pretty much like any medical clinic you might be familiar with. There were dozens of boxes shipped to Sochi so that we were able to care for our athletes. Our doctors saw everything from coughs and flu to sprains and breaks. As a result, we had a comprehensive team assembled to address whatever health-related need might have come through the door. We looked like a mix of care providers such as athletic trainers and physical therapists or chiropractors and massage therapists to assess and provide the best solution to the problem. Our goal was to have our athletes back on the slope, track, or rink as fast as possible, performing at their peak. I see. And uh, who cared for the athletes if there was a life-threatening injury? Well, if a situation like that had arisen, and I'm very happy to be able to say that thankfully it didn't, the intervention of doctors, specialists, and emergency providers from the Olympic Organizing Committee and our Team USA doctors would have absolutely been vital. We always had one of our physicians with the team during training and at competitions at the various sites. That gave us the flexibility to provide immediate care should the situation have occurred. We felt pretty confident that through our collaborative efforts, we could care for our athletes in just about any situation. Well done. And how did you approach injury prevention? Preventing injuries was certainly a major part of the support we provided. Aiding athletes and coaches to condition appropriately and prime their bodies with good nutrition and recovery efforts while in Sochi was all part of the whole care that we provided while we were there. We were able to use technology to assess and evaluate our athletes to ensure they were at their peak to perform. The travel and extreme competition did take a toll on the athletes' bodies, but we did our best to keep our athletes healthy in every respect. And were there any new technologies used by the U.S. medical team in Sochi? Well, one of the tools we used was a groundbreaking form of software which provided our physicians and athletes the ability to communicate health information instantaneously and securely. The software maintained diagnostics, treatment evaluations, and test results, and it was all accessible virtually. This was especially critical when we were traveling from venue to venue in a foreign country. I have since actually implemented the same software in my private practice. Now, no matter who is involved in the patient's care, the healthcare professional has easy access to all the critical information and can respond accordingly. We also had several ultrasound machines that we traveled with, which was an incredible diagnostic tool for many musculoskeletal injuries. And finally, how might other young physicians follow in your footsteps? Well, I would encourage any physician that aspires to this kind of uh, appointment to begin connecting with officials in their area of interest. My work with the U.S. cycling team helped build my reputation among other elite sport organizations, where I was able to establish relationships and convey my interest in working with them. You know, it can take a lot of time volunteering, but the work is invigorating and stimulating because you learn so much in the process, especially if you're passionate about it. I really do believe I am a better physician and surgeon because I've had the chance to work in these various situations. I can bring that experience back to my private practice, which elevates care for everyone.